Hi, I'm Kim and today I'll be discussing the major aspects of the business environment of the Kingdom of Cambodia, or Kampuchea as the local Khmers refer to the country. When most people think of Cambodia, they mostly associate it with the genocide and troublesome recent political past that featured throughout the 1970s, which has arguably carried repercussions through to the present day. It is a country that is synonymous with poverty and corruption in most forms of literature, and perhaps rightly so. Let us delve into the social, political and economic landscape of Cambodia to unearth its current business environment. Firstly, some local, uh, some local historical background. The local Khmers are descendants from the Angkor Empire, which in its zenith existed between the 10th and 13th centuries, and is the period in which the famous temples were erected. These very temples form the basis of which their major business industry, tourism, is centred on today. But more on this point later. After the decline and eventual demise of the Angkor Empire, Cambodia became part of the French Indochina in 1887, after the king placed the country under French protection in 1863. Cambodia gained independence from France in 1953, and in April 1975, we see the communist Khmer Rouge forces capture the capital, Phnom Penh, thus beginning the horrific Pol Pot re regime, which saw 1.5 million Cambodians die from execution, forced harsh hardships or starvation in a space of just three years. The Vietnamese invasion of 1878, nine, sorry, 1978 drove the Khmer Rouge into the countryside and thus beginning a further 10 year civil war. In 1989, the Cambodian economic system was transformed from a command or centrally planned economy to a market orientated one. Under the reform policy, the state of Cambodia uh, uh, sorry, under the reform policy of the state of Cambodia. Beginning also at this time, private property rights were introduced along with the privatisation of state-owned enterprises and investments, and prices and exchange weight rates were allowed to float. However, the economic reform was only a key to further strengthen the state's power to mobilise and administer and pursue economic development. The move to the free market economy increased social stratification, enriching those in power, particularly those with power over the privatisation of land and resources, and carried large groups and, and created large groups of marginalised or propertyless poor. These themes, and these themes of corruption and social inequality run thick throughout the Cambodian story and hindered and will continue to hinder sustainable economic development. In 1991, Paris Peace Accords mandated democratic elections and a ceasefire, but this was not fully adhered to by the Khmer Rouge. UN-sponsored elections in 1993 helped restore some normalcy and a constitutional monarchy was formed. The remaining elements of the Khmer Rouge surrendered in 1999. Elections in 2003 were relatively peaceful, as were the most recent elections in 2012. This basic historical context is important to note, as we will see how these implications are felt um, at the political, economic and social levels. After decades of war, the Cambodian economy and social structure was almost completely destroyed. Cambodia is among one of the poorest countries in Asia and long-term economic development remains a daunting challenge, constrained by widespread corruption, limited educational opportunities, high income inequality and poor job prospects. Figures from the CIA Factbook suggest that as of 2012, approximately 2.6 million people lived on $1.20 per day and 37% of Cambodian children under the age of five, suffer from chronic malnutrition. Cambodia has a relatively young population, with more than 50% of the population aged 25 or younger. This population lacks education and productivity skills, particularly in the impoverished countryside, which also lacks basic infrastructure. The relatively low level of education attainment in Cambodia can be explained by the dramatic political turmoil that has existed over the past few decades 
and has basically meant that an entire generation has emerged without any basic literacy or numeracy skills. The, it is, this is important because the labour force uh, plays an important role in economic growth, but if the government cannot provide enough employment or education for the young, then we will then start to see some more social problems arise. These aspects are worrisome in terms of business and economic development and basically for trying to break the poverty cycle for future prosperity. Having visited the country last year as a young, naive tourist, whom had previously never travelled overseas, let alone to a developing third world country, nothing could ever have prepared me for the sights and smells of Cambodia. In saying this, the Cambodian people are some of the happiest people I've ever met. This could probably be accorded with their um, divine faith in the Buddhist religion. They are also very grateful people, especially of the tourists. They recognise the potential tourism brings to the country. The tourism industry has become one of the main catalysts for the Cambodian uh, economic for Cambodian economic development. With an increasing labour force looking for jobs and a governmental deficit, tourism is seen as a solution to both of these problems. Cambodia has both great natural and cultural tourist attractions, and tourism has grown remarkably in Cambodia since the 1990s. The tourism industry helps Cambodian people to have jobs and income. The Cambodian government recognises tourism as one of the most important revenue generators and employment providers in post-conflict Cambodian economic development. They have initiated several policies to develop tourism. These include security and safety of tourists, um, improvements of services and infrastructure, regional cooperation and public-private sector partnerships. Direct and indirect impacts of tourism on socio-economic development are evident in Cambodia. I have experienced this firsthand. Um, the owner slash tour guide operator that I stayed with at um, a boutique hotel in Cambodia um, had said to me that since starting his business, he was um, it had allowed him to be in a position to send himself to school to further educate himself. He was then able to send his brothers and his sisters, his wife, and when the time eventually comes, he'll be able to send his children as well from all the money that he's been able to earn through this business. Um, so tourism is a majorly growing business industry for Cambodia and has helped reduce the cycle of poverty. Cambodia's economic growth over the last decade is the fastest among Asia's developing countries. Cambodian GDP grew at an average annual rate of over 8% between the year 2000 and 2010, and at least 7% since 2011. The tourism, garment, construction and real estate and agricultural sectors are, have accounted for the bulk of growth. Other industries include rice milling, wood, wood products, fishing, rubber, cement and textiles. The tourism industry has continued to grow rapidly with foreign arrivals exceeding 2 million per year since 2007 and reaching around 4.5 million visitors in 2004. The agriculture industry is another major industry in Cambodia. 85% of the Cambodian population lives, uh, lives in the rural areas and more than 75% of them are employed in the agricultural sector. The Cambodian government regards agriculture as a priority sector contributing to 30% of GDP and has actively contributed to reducing poverty. General agricultural products include rice, rubber, corn, vegetables, cashews and silk. Another fast growing industry that att attracts a great deal of international business um, and accounts for uh, about three quarters of the total of Cambodian exports is the textile industry. Like the other major industries, it too also plays an important role in reducing the cycle of poverty. The industry mostly employs female workers uh, that do not require a high level of education. Women here can expect a monthly salary of $50 per month, which is well over the $30 per month poverty line. The industry absorbs around 10% of the total Cambodian labour force and accounts for around 14% of GDP, although this figure is expected to rise with expanding export opportunities. That being said, Cambodia needs to be wary of the competition from Vietnam, India and China within this industry. Slow custom routines could be a point of concern for exporters. On average, it takes about 18 days to gain ex uh, export custom clearance in Cambodia. 
In India, it's 11, and in China, it's 7. This is therefore driving up the cost of production in Cambodia. Other concerns lie in the minimum wage policy in Cambodia, which outlines the basic wage, but it isn't consistent with productivity levels, remembering that it, this industry mostly contains uneducated women. So this is also forcing up the cost of production and making it difficult to compete with foreign producers. Other major export commodities include clothing, timber, rubber, rice, fish, tobacco and footwear, which accounted for about $7.8 billion last year. Major imports come in from Thailand, China, Vietnam, Singapore, Hong Kong and South Korea. These commodities include petroleum products, cigarettes, gold, construction materials, machinery, motor vehicles and some pharmaceutical products. Mining is another industry in Cambodia attracting some international investor interest in recent times and the government has pushed for opportunities for mining bauxite, gold, uh, iron and gem. A 2015 statement from the IMF executive directors reads, Cambodia's robust economic performance and the noteworthy progress made in achieving the Millennium Development Goals and the ongoing transition to lower middle country lower middle income country status is commendable. Cambodia is being well placed to take advantage of the transformation of regional trade patterns to expand and diversify its export base and further integrate into global supply chains. At the same time, directors have noted that domestic risks and the evolving external environment underscore the need to act decisively to address financial sector vulnerabilities safeguard policy buffers, and foster economic diversification. So while the figures and percentages look promising, in reality, if Cambodia doesn't introduce policies to help, external, uh, to help internal domestic industries, or more broadly, policies to help some of the social problems, such as lack of education and the young population, then internal business pros prospects will dwindle. Um, and then this is explained further in the continuation of the um, IMF statement. It says, over the medium term, robust economic growth supported by exports, tourism and construction activities have worked in favour for Cambodia's economic prospect. However, lingering global uncertainty and the planned slowdown in China's economic growth could pose downside risks to Cambodia's growth outlook. So as we've seen, the relatively robust economic growth has not resulted in improvements in welfare for most Cambodians. The distribution of growth is not equal and the poor seem to be left out of the benefits. The level of socio-economic inequality between urban and rural areas is growing, largely due to the garment and the tourism industries which are based mainly in the urban areas, meaning the funds and resources that are generated from these industries um, are largely contained only to the metropolitan areas and aren't filtering out to the rural areas creating um, greater social stratification. Since the 1990s, Cambodia has tried to transform itself into a domestic market oriented country. However, the major issues of corruption and governance are still at the forefront of socio-economic development. The challenge for Cambodia over the next decade will be fashioning an economic environment in which the private sector can create enough jobs to handle Cambodia's demographic imbalance, as well as education and healthcare reforms. If the social, political and economic landscape were improved, Cambodia would have a better chance at international business trade. They would have greater infrastructure resources and a better educated, skilled and engaged workforce. Perhaps the greatest issue holding the social, political and economic landscape back is corruption. Without this issue being rectified, all other factors will remain and eventually stunt the overall progress of the economy. Thank you. And I hope this video has been informative for you all.